be seated. This time I'll invite you, if you will, please stand together with me as we read 1 Peter chapter 4 and our verses this morning, our passage is verses 7 through 11. The title of our message is Living on the Edge of Eternity. Hear the word of the Lord. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, there's a word for us. The end of all things is at hand. There's a word. Let's consider what the great sermons in history look like and the responses to those sermons. Maybe you've read about Jonathan Edwards in colonial America, pre-colonial America, as he authored a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It is said that Edwards did not have a dramatic flair or mannerism, that he had the sermon written out word for word, verbatim, and would would unfold the paper and read the sermon in a basic monotone voice, simply revealing the truths of God's coming judgment and the spirit of God worked so mightily on people that it is said that they would grip the backs of the pews because they thought they were plunging into hell while they listened to him read the sermon. We, we hear that and we realize that as powerful as that sounds, Edward's sermon was rather lengthy. I've read it. Rather verbose, too. Quite a bit of vocabulary that we have to hurl ourselves over in reading that. But Peter has merely opened this with the statement, the end of all things is at hand. Concise. It's to the point. It needs no explanation. It simply requires a response. We have to hear and believe exactly what is being said. You know, there's a similar message of about the same length that I think goes down as one of the greatest sermons in history as far as what we would expect in terms of response. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, Jonah walks into the city of Nineveh and here is his sermon. Yet, 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In our English translation, that's exactly eight words. So is what Peter has said to us in opening. Eight words. The message resulted in an entire city turning to God in repentance. From the king all the way down to the lowliest servant, the king's orders were such that he even demanded that the animals be put in sackcloth and ashes because they need to be repenting for what we have just heard. That's how mightily they were responding to the word. That was Jonah speaking to a wicked population of this people, Nineveh, the Assyrian people. And Peter, though, is addressing the household of faith. Let's not lose touch with these eight words. The end of all things is at hand is 
a book in a book that is fixing us on an ultimate end for which we, God's people, should be pursuing holiness and most immediately in our preaching, we see enduring suffering and affliction. When I was a kid, we had an old retired minister named Tommy Griggs that attended our church. As far as I know, Brother Tommy never owned a car. I don't know that he ever did. My mom and dad picked him up and took him to church, and so I got to visit with Brother Tommy. We, uh, we didn't have minivans back in the day, uh, station wagons, yes, but, but I would just sit there in the seat. Brother Tommy would sit right next to me, and he would tell some of his stories of ministry. And every now and again, Brother Tommy would preach. Those old country preachers. He, he didn't have even much formal education by way of just regular education. You know, middle school perhaps was all he had had available to him even. But I remember that Tommy would preach and, and it would thunder. I believe the coming of the Lord is closer today than it's ever been, would be his statement. I thought, well, that counts every single second of every day. I didn't think that back then. I was convinced that it was time for the coming of the Lord. That hardly seems revelatory to us, except it was a statement of a fact of the man's heart, what he believed about Jesus Christ. It forms what we are to even study in the Scripture today because it's the preface of everything that we are going to say given how we are to live in light of the fact that eternity is coming. I wonder, are we living today in light of eternity? Is, is our life being molded? Are our decisions being made because that day is coming when we will all be in heaven in the presence of Jesus? Or does something else capture our attention? Are we a distracted people not living in light of eternity. What follows Peter's declaration that the end of all things is near are some very brief instructions on how we are to govern our life in light of this truth. We live right now, this second, we live on the edge of eternity. And seeing that truth governing us then I believe should bring us to the following that we'll observe in our message today. Since the end of all things is near, we must prepare our mind and prioritize our ministry to do what will give glory to God alone. Prepare our minds and prioritize our ministry to do what will give glory to to God alone. If this is the end of all things, I want us to ask ourselves, have we prepared our minds for it? Are, are, is our thinking uh, being governed by this divine truth, this revelation? This has already become for us a matter of of the mind. Last week when we were looking at the beginning of chapter 4, since therefore Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. And so it was something that we were already commanded to. There is this idea of preparation of thought. Many professions have to go through some kind of rigorous mental preparation. Soldiers have to, and as part of their training, be involved in, in extreme uh, sleep deprivation so that they can perform under great duress. People in medical professions have to do a, a very severe training and uh, long nights without sleep. And part of that is the training. When you're called upon, you have to be alert and be able to perform the task that you have before you. Whenever he says this, that the end of all things is near, the first thing that he speaks of 
are two matters of our minds that need to be addressed. Be self-controlled and sober-minded. Self-controlled, I believe, is something that, that points to what our actions are, and sober-minded speaks about what our motives are. Our actions and motives are both being addressed here in the Scripture. Self-controlled is a word that is talking about our response to things. There's no knee-jerk reaction of the Christian to whatever events may occur in their day. It's not something that, that should be affected by a simple blip on the radar. It's talking about having a mind that is right for what we are about to face, what we know is coming forward. Scripture is filled with all kinds of prophecy warning us about a falling away in 2 Timothy chapter 4, warning us about the rise of the Antichrist in 1 John chapter 2 and also in 2 Thessalonians. We're, we're told that there is going to be this rise of false teaching and false teachers. Beloved, we don't respond to that in the sense of suddenly abandoning all hope. These are expected things. We are warned about them specifically because the mind of the Christian must be prepared with the truth of God's Word so that we respond self-controlled or we are self-controlled, our actions are. There also is this word sober-minded. Sober-minded is a word that aims at the things that, that really the base meaning of it, things that would impede judgment. In fact, the meaning of this word is about abstaining from the use of alcohol. That's actually why it is translated for us sober-minded. It's not a command against that. It's saying that the discipline that must exist would never invite a substance that would impede judgment. It was the way they would make the expression. We saw this word being used last week. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it was used twice. In fact, this word only occurs six times in the New Testament. But there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, it says, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Don't do something that would cause you to desire to slumber. Verse 8 said, But since, this is what we read last week, since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Literally, when they're saying it, the, the base meaning of it is to abstain from wine, but simply means that we are to be controlled not only in our actions, but controlled in our thinking. Are we careful to be of things, to be free of things that might cause you and I to stumble drunkenly? to respond and to have actions that are simply driven by emotion based on some little bit of information that has just occurred? Are we prone to wander very quickly in our thoughts and in our aims? These are the things that we're encouraged to address in our lives in light of the end of all things being near. When the writer of Hebrews was talking about this regarding the life of faith, he said in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He calls us to pay close attention to the things that would cause us otherwise to stumble. To set those aside and, and in submission to the holy will and authority of God to lay those aside so that we might run unimpeded, not driven by actions simply based on emotions, to not be impeded by whatever it may be that we are partaking of in life and not let those be a distraction or a, an encumbering weight. 
What is the chief danger, though, of not being sober? What is most affected or most stands to be affected according to what we have read? He says, but the end of all things is near. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. For the sake of your prayers. Child of God, let me ask you this. When we're at home and we have bowed our heads to pray, are you subject to think about other things than to pray? How often is it that we seek to come before the throne of God and then suddenly Brother Tony starts wondering if he is taking care of this chore or did I check that email or have I responded to that message and suddenly a litany of little thoughts begin to encumber my thinking in prayer. When Brother Michael pauses our singing for a time of personal worship, are, are we with heads bowed in submission to that moment, personally worshiping our Creator and coming before His throne of grace and praying for the word that we are about to hear and the songs that we have sung and and focusing our thoughts for that moment entirely on God? Or are there other things that we're talking about? Like, I wonder if I made the reservation or I wonder if we will get out at 11 or 11.05 and uh, are we going to be somehow impeded by what? He says, for the sake of your prayers. Isn't it interesting? Preaching, what? Preaching may never be affected by those things. I mean, for crying out loud, you just kind of show up and somebody does that for you. You just have to listen a little bit. Maybe, maybe if somebody has a a dull tone, you'll tend to drift and daydream. Maybe that will happen. But, But for the most part, I think we're pretty capable of coming together and conferring over Scripture. But when it comes to that very intimate conversation with God, Are you self-controlled? Is your mind subject to wander or your actions subject to be inclined to things that right now don't matter nearly as much as coming before Almighty God and making your petitions known to Him and praising Him for who He is? Christian, the end of all things is at hand. Can we pray? Can we pray fervently? Earnestly, if we are distracted in our thoughts, why those thoughts can carry us basically anywhere. But I challenge you, go to the Psalms and read the Psalms and see how in times of duress and in times of joy that the psalmist's eyes are turned toward the throne of God to give him praise. When enemies have risen up, they turn to God and they ask him for help and they see that in God there is victory. You see, you see, the Psalms show us what it is to be sober-minded and self-controlled in that, yes, there has been something that is upsetting that brings the psalm out, but the Spirit of God has now directed the psalmist to praise God and to plead with God for His blessing and His protection. If we're not careful... If we're not careful, we'll get really distracted just by the content of that first message that we heard. The end of all things is at hand. Brothers and sisters, it is no mystery to us. I'm not revealing anything about how distracting end time stuff becomes. It seems like every time there's a solar eclipse, the end of the world is being forecast. Not not long ago, John Hagee uh, took well advantage of four blood moons falling in about a year and a half's time, and he swore that was the end of the era. Sold books, and what does ha- what happens? We find that someone does a little series on prophecy, does a few little predictions. The next thing you know, people are talking about that sermon series. They're talking about these uh, these heavenly signs. They're talking about the latest book that has been written. But they are not talking about prayer. 
This is what Peter is saying. You'll be tending towards everything else rather than the throne of God who is going to be calling you before his throne in the very near future. If this is the end, have we prepared our minds for that or are we living like it's going to be going on for a long time? We tend to talk a lot about the end times but not live like it's the end of time. The second thing that he says here is if this is the end, Do we have right priorities in ministry? There's a question. If if today is the last day, I mean, if this is it, if sometime before our home groups meet this evening, if we think Christ is going to return in the next four hours, have we prioritized our service today to be the last time we would ever meet? Are, Are we thinking that way? Do the ministries that we attend to, do they reflect those who believe Christ's return is imminent or at least the call of some to be before him is imminent because while he may not return, some may depart this life. There's given to us in these next verses what I see as a threefold approach, how we can see whether or not we are prioritizing our ministries in light of this being the end of all things. I see it conveniently as our hearts, our homes, and our hands are going to reflect it. Our hearts, our homes, and our hands. Look, if you would, in verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Our hearts are going to be something that reveals to us if we have priority concerning this being the end of all things. Our love for others will be earnest. Earnest means it will be a constant, unwavering love, and particularly it's going to be a love for their spiritual good. It says, that this love will cover a multitude of sins. True love, you see, is going to strive for reconciliation. While we may prioritize reconciliation with one another, what we are ultimately talking about, if we're talking about gospel love, it is reconciling of all sinners with Almighty God. By the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God and the blood of Christ at Calvary, We seek for them to have a multitude of sins covered over by the righteousness of Christ. In James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, it says there, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You see, real love, real love is a stern love. It is a disciplinary love. It is a call to believe the gospel, to repent of sin, to depend on Christ and Christ alone for life. James is very clear in what he articulates there. Bring back a sinner from his wandering. That. Self-control is out the window. Sober-mindedness is out the window. And so then a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ appeals to this one who's in the flesh and calls for them to return to Christ or to come to Christ. In so, so doing, James says, saves his soul from death. You know what should drive us in our desire for this ministry of reconciliation with the wayward sinner is the fear of that person standing before the Lord in judgment guilty of that sin. We should call them to repentance with no apologies. We should share Christ with the lost with no apologies. It is the only hope. Child of God, this is our call. 
to love them with our whole hearts. Real love is a desire to see a restoration, a return, to see a reconciliation of one's relationship with God. He also says that our homes will be prepared for this ministry that is in front of us. We'll see the priority in our homes. He says in verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now there's a word, isn't it? Show hospitality without grumbling. Now the word there, interestingly, can be translated murmuring and it's definition is is literally just kind of a kind of a word that produces the sound you ever thought about murmur 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 you know it's kind of kind of just the little yeah yeah you're welcome at our home until you're not welcome at our home anymore it's also translated begrudgingly as though one is forced into an awkward position to have to show this kind of hospitality. Beloved, I I believe that we need to capture what this is intending. It's not talking just about us opening our home and having somebody over to our home for a meal. It's talking about the movement of the gospel in that day. You see, the early church two millennia ago And for two millennia, really, of the expansion and growth of the Lord's church, the spread of the gospel around the world, it was driven as much by generous hosts and hostesses as it was by the men and women who were preaching and teaching and carrying the word of God. You see, there were those who were absolutely dependent on the Christian host to take them into their home and provide them a place to lodge briefly so that ministry could be perpetuated and could move forward. Jesus was ministered to by a band of faithful women, we're told in the Gospel of Luke. And the ministry of the apostles in every way recognizes the homes of those and the families of those servants who aided them. For instance, Paul said to Timothy, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. As Paul is in in bondage for the gospel, here is a brother in Christ who his show of Christian hospitality and ministry is to literally minister to the physical needs of the disciple, of the apostle. When he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. You see, very close in relation to our hearts and to our homes is going to come that our hands must be employed in this work of ministry, that they must have as a priority to be be useful tools of ministry. In verse 10, it says, as each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Our use of resources will be employed as ministers of God's grace. That the manifold ways that God will reveal himself and save souls in the name of Jesus Christ in some way is going to be used, uh, going to use the employment of whatever gifts God has given to me, whether that be of substance or whether that be of service or whether that be my very own self, that I yield all to God so that God will use that for his glory. You know, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Dave Ramsey and Financial Peace University. Maybe you've heard some of his programs or maybe you've even done a study of his curriculum. But but one thing that Dave Ramsey is trying to make a priority for Christians is that we handle our resources well so that when we have our resources handled well, we can then use those for the good of God's kingdom 
to show generosity and great generosity in a time when we're not so dependent or wondering where the next check or what is going to pay for the next meal or what's going to cover the next bill, but for all of those things to finally be under wraps and we're able to then use our resources for the blessing of God's kingdom and use in God's kingdom. Peter's instruction entails this, both serving others and being stewards of God's grace. That what God has given to you can be used and employed for the purposes of furthering His kingdom. Friend, have you ever considered how your time and your resources can be used generously? I'm not talking about cutting blank checks for anybody. That God would use you to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world through a simple act, perhaps, of hospitality or generosity or even service. I can't, I can't summarize the number of times that people have done simple things that have saved minutes or hours or days of life in ministry. I came out of a church one day and I had a, an appointment following in just a couple of hours. I'm in my jacket and tie and there is a flat tire on the van. And without even asking, these two farmers in West Helena, Arkansas, grabbed a jack, got the tools, popped the tire off, ran back to their shop, came back, put the tire on in a half hour without me even breaking a sweat or touching anything. I'm in my car and I'm heading back down the road. Just men who had an ability that said it is for the glory of God. And I made the next appointment and preached Christ there too. It is is those selfless acts of service that are the very stewardship of all the things that God has given to us to see His kingdom message move forward. Consider that living for eternity may be the assurance that there are simply the future means that are needed for preaching Christ. According to this, the Spirit enables us, enables us for two chief aims. Peter here talks about spiritual gifts. Interestingly enough, he doesn't give us a catalog of spiritual gifts. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about prophecies and evangelism and pastoring and teaching. And he doesn't talk about gifts of hospitality and administration. He doesn't give us this, this list. He gives us two categories that the Spirit enables us in this service. Speaking and serving. He says... Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. I don't intend for this in any way to sound like boasting. But I'll promise you this. If you happen to show up at a place where I've been called to preach and only three people show up, they're going to get the same sermon that you get on a Sunday morning. And if I happen to show up somewhere and a thousand people show up, they're going to get the same sermon that you get on Sunday morning. Because this is the Word of God. The oracles of God. What God has revealed for the souls of men, no, no matter where we are, no matter, no matter what group of people we are addressing, no matter what part of the planet that we have gone to, speaking calls attention to the Word of God. And it says here that we are given not only gifts that are part of of preaching or speaking the oracles of God, but also service that calls attention to the provision of God. Very carefully notice those who speak, that they are speaking the oracles of God, and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Friends, just like it would be a temptation for someone with natural speaking abilities to simply lean on those natural speaking abilities, we may also simply want to lean on the provision of God and pretend that that is the ministry. But some 
of the most gracious saints I've ever been in the presence of had very meager livings and meager households and were simply gracious and generous with all that God had given them for the service of his kingdom. Such great people who minister tirelessly for the Lord's church, volunteering without ever seeking to be in the limelight, doing it. Why? Because the strength of the Lord is upon them. The desire of their hearts is to see souls saved. Spiritual gift inventories are a very little help. In fact, there was a season where I think they almost became useless. There was so much attention giving, given to those things and people seemed to be more entranced with finding out what their spiritual gift was rather than using the spiritual gift God had given to them. When here, Peter says, look, you're either going to be saying something about God or you're going to be serving God, but the Spirit of God has made it so you're going to be doing that. It's action. It's being employed. And that is because bringing us to our final observation, if this is the end, we need to know, is that being reflected in our worship? I mean, if this was the last time that we're here, are we glad we were in the house of the Lord just before that trumpet sounds? Have, have we sung praise to God? Have we offered up praise to him with our lips in prayer? Have we ministered to one another faithfully? Have we heard the word of God faithfully? If this is the end, how is it being reflected in our worship? All, all spiritual gifts aim at a single uniform purpose. This principle was something that was kind of refined and brought forward. It was always there, but kind of refined and brought forward from the Reformation when they were abbreviating those, those doctrines that became, uh, that were revived or reawakened uh, in the Reformation. They're called the solas, and the fifth of those is that all things are for the glory of God alone. Look at what the scripture says, because they didn't discover this in the Reformation. They discovered it in the word of God. In order that in everything God may be glorified. You see that? In order that in everything God may be glorified. Even our final glorification in heaven, when you and I pass from death to death, into life everlasting, that is for the glory of God. It results in the further glorifying of God. Heaven is all about God. It's not about me, not about you. It's not about the loved ones that have gone on before us. Those, those emotional pinings that we have right now will fade away when all of us are standing in the presence of our Creator and His Son, Jesus Christ, giving praise to them, praise to Him. How does God receive this glory from us? The Scripture here says that He receives it through Christ. God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And in that glimpse of the throne room of heaven that we have in Revelation chapter 5, John says, Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. You see, when we are introduced to the activities of heaven, all praise is directed, all glory is directed to God the Father, God is glorified through Jesus Christ alone. 
And that is what was recovered when things had been so perverted by Roman Catholicism and those priests like Martin Luther come out and they say, wait, the Word of God says this. Well, this is what they discover and this is what the Word of God teaches us. That it's revealed to us by the Scriptures alone. That the gospel is ours by the grace of God through faith alone, through Jesus Christ alone. And that that is for the glory of God alone. This passage closes with a final benediction, almost reflective of how we conclude our service. Except Peter, like a real good Baptist preacher, ends with amen and goes on for another chapter and a half. Isn't that cool? To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All glory belongs to God. Whatever is praiseworthy brings praise to him. Perhaps you've already noticed it. I mean it when I say it. If you come... 90% of the time and you say to me, Pastor, I enjoyed your message or I appreciate the message or thank you for the message, my response most generally is praise the Lord. It was Jesus, not me. It's his word, not me. He is the one who is worthy of the glory. He receives the glory for all of this. Word in Baptist Church, if someone praises the church for their ministry to them in our community, we in exchange say, praise the Lord. To him be the glory forever. Glory and dominion. Child of God, rest in that for a moment. Remember the audience, strangers and aliens, outcasts, and uh, often countries that were not their home. In a day when it seems like things may very well be going out of control, oh, they are not out of control, friend. All dominion belongs to God and the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. There's not one moment and not one molecule that is outside of God's sovereign dominion. The thoughts of God and his majesty dominate your motivations for worship, that this is who we worship and this is who we serve. If not, then I have two appeals. One is the appeal to those who today do not have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you've never bowed your knee to Christ, never said, Lord, I believe this gospel. I believe that what Christ did at Calvary was done for me. I believe this. I call on the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of my sins. I pray to Almighty God, God will hear your prayer and he will save you, friend. You will have peace with God. Come to him before it's too late. The end of all things is at hand. Don't, don't delay this call. But child of God, are we distracted? Are we reacting to things in our world today in drunkenness of information? Looking at this world with hopeless lenses on rather than lenses that are governed by the word of God and Christ. And hoping in the day of the Lord that is at hand The end of all things is near, and that is a day of hope for you and I. Hope in Christ. Have your mind governed by his words and your actions, governed by a right understanding of his words. And then word in church, love. Love with hearts that are earnestly seeking to show holy love. Show hospitality and open our hearts and our homes to the love that the Lord has shown to us in welcoming us into his kingdom. And then commit our hands.
to the task of ministry and say, Lord, whatever I have is yours. Use it to your glory and honor to magnify the name of Jesus Christ. And remember that God can take that and multiply it to feed multitudes. Child of God, live in light of eternity.